We're live. Okay. So, good evening, and uh, we'll call the public hearing to order. It's a single item agenda, consideration of amendments to the Chester Municipal Planning Strategy and Land Use Bylaw to introduce the Lakeside Zone. And just before we start, uh, I've been given some instructions that I should share primarily for the public. So I will. Uh, we're using a sort of the new technology, and this is not our normal method of holding public hearings, so it, uh, hopefully it all works out perfectly. But uh, we're live streaming the proceedings on YouTube after the hearing. It will remain online for later access. Comments on the live stream are closed for the time being, being but will open during the public input section of the agenda. At that time, spectators who wish to share public input to be read at the hearing can either post it in the comments section or email their input to communications at chester.ca. That's communications, an S, at chester.ca. We will acknowledge respectful comments relevant to the issues being discussed. Members of the public registered to speak during the hearing will have five minutes each to share their feedback. Please state your full name and community and community for the public record when you have the floor. Speakers are in order according to when we receive the submissions. And uh, that's it. Hopefully that all works. Uh, so um, we'll have uh, Mr. Lamy, I'm assuming this is Matters properly before council? Yes, Mr. Warren, I'm satisfied the matter is properly before council. Okay, thank you. We'll have an overview by the planner. Great, thank you. So uh, good evening, everyone. Um, so I'll just do a quick a quick overview because where we are at the public hearing, we have, uh, we've obviously discussed this with council a couple of times, but then of course, happy to answer any questions um, yeah. uh, you know, during the discussion. Uh, portion. So uh, the lakeside zone that we have as a draft zone here tonight, uh, is a reflection of uh, a variety of discussions and conversations with several groups of residents and property owners over the last, I would say, five to seven years. It started during our plan review process, um, and there were several discussions around environmental protections and protections of residential character around uh, lakes. Um, and some of that made it into the plan review in, in terms of the lakefront overlay, the setback that we introduced from lakes. Um, but there were some things that, that, that didn't get addressed in, in that plan review. And since that time, a number of groups have uh, come forward to council to request rezonings or strengthening of regulations. And again, um, the variety of requests differed somewhat, but typically it was themed around two things, which was limiting commercial and industrial uses and protection for the environment. And so uh, through a, a series of meetings with council, um, staff uh, eventually came uh, came up with the concept of a lakeside zone. Uh, we brought that to council in June of 2021 with some options. Uh, it was sort of a concept at that point, and we were looking for some options or some direction on how council would like to see that zone applied once or if it was adopted into the plan. That was where we had a discussion that and council opted for it was option two in that report, which basically said that we would consider the lakeside zone on a case-by-case -case basis. So we look at individual lakes when a request came in from an individual or from a group, and that would go through our normal rezoning process, just like any other uh, rezoning would. So with that direction, we went back, uh, kind of uh, tightened up uh, the provisions in the zone and the way it would be implemented, and then brought that back for, uh, for first reading, which happened in October. Um, and uh, that, that's brought us to this point with the, uh, with the current lakeside zone. So just to, to quickly kind of cover some of the highlights within the zone, uh, actually I'll make one point first, which is that what we're discussing tonight is the creation of the lakeside zone. If, uh, if uh, the, there's a vote in favor of this zone tonight, uh, no land in the municipality will be rezoned, but the zone will be available for groups to then request council to consider rezoning their property. Um, and the first of those that will be considered would be Sherbrooke sure Lake because we have had a request to, to consider that. But that only happens if the zone is approved tonight and then we begin a brand new rezoning process from the beginning. And, and when we're undertaking any specific rezoning, that will involve a direct mail-up to all affected property owners. 
So I know we've heard some comments from people that didn't hear about this meeting tonight. Um, that's unfortunate, but what I can tell you is certainly before any property that you own is rezoned, you will receive a direct mail letter process. from us to advise that that's going on and how to have input and feedback on that. So um, yeah, so just to touch on what is in the zone, what will be available uh, if this is successful. Um, it basically uh, has limits on, um, or the intent again is, is environmental protection and, uh, and residential character. Uh, so we have provisions to maintain a 10 meter vegetated buffer that's inland from the high water mark. Um, that uh, is intended to slow down runoff and filter uh, filter uh, sediment as it, as it makes its way toward the lake. Um, there are provisions in the draft zone that would allow for partial clearing within that vegetated buffer. That's to allow both views of the water as well as access to the water. Uh, so it, there's a number of regulations, but in essence, it allows up to 30% of that buffer area to be cleared to allow for access and, and, uh, and views. Um, the vegetated buffer was one of those pieces that was discussed during plan review and was ultimately left out of the lakefront overlay, but there still are groups of residents who would like to see it in their areas, and that's, that's why that's, uh, that's here. Um, the, uh, the zone also has, uh, as I mentioned, restrictions on uh, what type of land uses can be, uh, be developed there, so you can have up to two residential dwelling units per lot in the zone. Um, commercial uses are uh, are restricted. Um, however, home-based businesses, so things like uh, craft workshops or uh, professional offices, those kind of things, you can operate out of your home uh, within within the zone. Um, forestry processing was something that came up, and uh, we did want to make a point that this zone certainly does not have any impact on uh, pr provincially regulated activity of forestry, the cutting and hauling of trees. What we regulate, and as we do in our other zones, is forestry processing, and so that's the uh, the milling or the sawing, uh, basically taking a raw product and, and creating a, a, a more refined product from it. So mills and things like that are considered forestry processing. Those are permitted in the zone. They just have some regulations. Yeah, to go ahead. As far as clearing your forest, cutting right. logs. Fire. You still follow your provincial regulations like you always have. Absolutely. Um, let's see here. We also have some uh, regulations for uh, for RVs in the zone. Uh, basically, on a vacant lot, you could have two RVs. Um, on a lot that has a, a, a dwelling unit, you could have one RV. So it, it it in essence keeps you towards that two dwelling units per lot number, whether you're using an RV or a, a, a cottage. Um, another uh, sort of unique piece about the lakeside zone is. If and when we do consider rezoning around any particular lake, the depth of the zone is not defined, and that will be part of that consideration and process to rezone. So um, the, the reasoning behind that is we didn't want to uh, overly burden folks and, and zone further back than we needed, but based on topography and uh, vegetation, a number of other things, it may make sense in, in some areas to only have a fairly small area within the zone, and in other areas, we would want to extend back further again, with the goal of accomplishing the protecting the environment, slowing down right off that, that type of thing. Um, so that's sort of a, a quick overview of the zone, but again, I'd be happy to, to go into the and, uh, detail or question there. Um, just to quickly touch on the public engagement process uh, for this file, um, uh, we, we follow the standard you know, public engagement process that we, uh, that we normally do, including newspaper notifications. Uh, again, because this is a general amendment just to create the zone itself, there was no direct neighbor notification. We don't have an area, even though much of the conversation has been around Sheriff Clay, we don't have an area to notify right now. This technically is going to be available for the whole, uh, the whole municipality. Um, so we did have a public information meeting, uh, and we had uh, six members uh, in attendance in that, for that meeting. Um, this also was considered by the Municipal Planning Advisory Committee. Um, they uh, recommended in favor, but with a few changes, and those changes were were ultimately left off at the council table. Yeah. Basically, from the planning advisory committee, that the main thrust that they were looking for was to have a petition process required each time we would consider this rezoning. Yeah. Council opted not to go with that, and that's in keeping with all of our other rezoning processes. We don't use a petition for for anything yeah. else. So, um, so that, that change was there. Um, and uh, I guess just to, to touch on the, on the advertisements here, so 
Quickly, so uh, again, in, in, meet, in terms of meeting dates, the initial meeting uh, when we had the request from Wildor Park was back on December 17th, 2020. We then, uh, as I mentioned, uh, brought a report to Council in June of 2021 with sort of the concept zone and those initial options. Uh, then in July of 2021, we brought a full report to the Planning Advisory Committee. Uh, September 1st, 2021 was the public information meeting. October 28th was first reading at Council. Um, and then on November 10th, uh, we selected the date for tonight as the public hearing. So that's sort of the meeting history. Um, and then similarly on advertisements, we had uh, ad in the progress. Well, I should say all of these ads were also on the municipal website on the office doors as well. Uh, and so that was July 21st for the Municipal Planning Advisory Committee meeting, uh, August 25th for the public information meeting, January 22nd for the first notice of tonight's meeting, and uh, January 19th, there's a typo in my report here, it says July, uh, January 19th, 2022 for the second notice of public hearing. Um, so with, uh, oh, and the other thing on this report, it says that there were no written submissions received. We now do have three written submissions received and those were included sure. in the package tonight. So we all have, when this was prepared, we hadn't received it yet. Yeah. So, yeah. Um, but that I'll, I'll turn it over, but again, be happy to. Okay. Anyone, any questions before we move on to the public session? Okay, uh, I'm not running this particular piece, but uh, is now we don't have a presentation from the developer because there is no developer in this particular case. So it's comments by the public on the proposal. And uh, the first speaker is Robin McGann. So, uh, I leave that to whoever finds the technology to deal with. Okay, go ahead, Robin. And did that work? Can you hear me? Yes, yes. I can. Great. Well, good evening, everyone. And uh, uh, thank you, Warden and Council, for the chance to uh, make a few comments about, uh, about this matter. Um, as is apparent, my name is Robin McAdam. I'm here as a property owner uh, on Sherbrooke Lake and also as president of the Sherbrooke Forest Homeowners Association, which is a, a group of about 28 landowners. Uh, I would like to speak in favor of the creation of the proposed lakeside zone, recognizing this is a first step in achieving that type of zoning uh, for Sherbrooke Lake. This is a very important initiative and uh, certainly council and staff are to be commended for advancing it. Uh, I know it takes a lot of effort to work through this and, and it's greatly appreciated. But as, uh, as Garth has indicated, the, the, zone, the zone from my perspective achieves two objectives. First, it requires compatible uses. And I'd have to say, I was both quite alarmed and uh, uh, somewhat embarrassed at my ignorance when I learned that our lake uh, subdivision was zone general basic. As, as you know, uh, the kinds of uses uh, allowed in general basic are very broad and some of them do not make sense to have as lakefront neighbors. The proposed lakeside zone very sensibly restricts uses to those that are compatible with the extensive cottage development that has occurred on the lake. Uh, certainly this is the highest and best use of this land and accordingly creates the most assessment for the municipality. And so as such, I think it's prudent for the municipality to protect the value of the existing dwellings and the investments of the property owners. The second, the proposed lakeside zone affords important environmental protections and those environmental protections also serve to protect the value of lakeside properties. For both of the past two years, the Nova Scotia Department of Environment has issued water quality advisories for the lake because of algae growth occurrences. Those advisories essentially make everyone nervous about swimming in the lake. Everyone recognizes this is a problem that needs to be addressed and the property values will inevitably be affected if people aren't comfortable swimming in the lake. Now, it's not an easy problem to manage the nutrient inflow that is harming the lake. 
but the vegetative buffer incorporated into the lakeside zone is a widely accepted strategy for helping to achieve this objective. It isn't all that needs to be done, but it will be very helpful. Of course, cottage owner education is very important as well. And I know that this council through the Water Quality Committee is working on that and that's greatly appreciated. The implementation of a lakeside zone also has important educational benefits. It sends the message, and it's unfortunate we need to do this, but that the lake needs help. That runoff of fertilizers and waste are a problem and the creation of a lakeside zone would build awareness around the lake protection issue. The leadership of this council is critical in this regard. Creating this zone is the most compelling step that can be taken to encourage the adjacent municipality Lunenburg to do the same thing on the other side of the lake. I would also note that creating the zone is completely compatible with the municipal planning strategy, in particular policies V7 and V8. Uh, I'm sure you know what these say, but just for the record, policy V7 indicates that all land in the municipality shall be subject to, at a minimum, basic land use regulations that A, control very large or disruptive land uses, B, safeguard the natural environment. In policy V8, uh, just part of it, a key part, council shall consider more restrictive planning regulations when a group of residents has shown that it wishes to consider such regulations. And of course, Garth has, has indicated the history of that. Yeah, Robin, I just want to you that there's a minute left in your time slide. I've only got four lines to go, thank you. The, um, <laughs> and, and, uh, and to close, I would just like to commend council and staff for the considerable thought and effort they've invested in shaping proposed lakeside zone, including making sure it has no adverse impacts on the forestry operations that occur around the lake. And I encourage council to ad adopt the lakeside zone as proposed. Thank you very much. Well, thank you very much for your comments. Okay, uh, Greg McQueen. Well, that's what's on my list anyway. Yep, he's, he should be, you should be able to see him soon. Go ahead, Fred. Fred, your, your turn. All right, can you hear me now? Yeah, yeah, can. All right, good. Um, yes, I'm um, joining you from Halifax and appreciate the chance to, to say a few words. Uh, about the zoning issue. Uh, I'm part of the Sherbrooke Forest Homeowners Association and support uh, the more restrictive lakeside zoning that is on the table. I think it's one of the best things we can do to protect the lake and um, it's consistent with other actions that our association has taken. You may recall that we uh, supported uh, opening up access to the lake, but <clears throat> on the condition that steps be taken to protect the, the environment. Um, we've been supporting the idea of vegetation buffers even before the uh, question of zoning came up. Um, and our members have also been quite active in uh, monitoring uh, water quality uh, and, and sending those results in. So I'm confident that if we were to do a canvas of our membership, um, I think everybody would vote in favor of, uh, of lakeside zoning. It's something that we've discussed over email at our annual meeting in the summer and on other occasions. And my impression is uh, that it would also be positively received by others in the same area who appreciate the lake and have access to it. So uh, that's basically what I wanted to say. I'll, I'll leave the, the details to the, to the experts. Um, 
on, on zoning. Um, but thank you again for the opportunity to speak. Thank you very much for your comments. Okay, the Dean Millett. Okay, Nadine, you're up. Yes, thank you very much. Um, I actually just thought I was listening, so I'm not as gonna be as eloquent as uh, Fred and Robin, but I'm sitting here with my, my mother, um, Elsie, who's uh, at 88 and the matriarch of our cottage that's in Wildor Park. And I myself um, own a, a camp in um, Sherbrooke Forest. And I wanted to say how happy we are that uh, the municipality of Chester and council is considering this lakeside zone. It's so progressive and it means so much to us. We've been uh, as a family coming to Sherbrooke Lake um, and New Ross for I guess uh, 50, over, 40. Or over 40 or close to 50 years. And uh, it's mm. a very, very precious um, place to us that we've seen a lot of changes on the lake that have not been very promising. There's a lot more algae and weird stuff growing on the, on the lake. And there's not the same fish as there was when I was a child. Uh, I used to see trout all the time. So I've seen changes that aren't as positive. Um, the, the recent, uh, scare with the possible blue algae, um, was awful. I was afraid to go down with my dogs. I was afraid to swim. Um, I have been noticing, even though there wasn't a, a toxic uh, LG, I have been noticing in recent years when I get out of the water, it's, I sneeze more, it's itchy. It's, so I'm, I'm mentioning these things just uh, back up how important this initiative is um, for, for the province, for uh, Canada, just doing these sorts of things is what needs to happen. And I'm so proud to be in and part of a, a municipality that is forward thinking and leading the way in this. And I really, really hope this gets passed. Um, the general basic around the lake just makes no sense whatsoever. Um, it's such a, a delicate area. And so, so that's all I, I had to say. And, and thank you so, so much for giving us an opportunity to speak. Thank you very much for your comments. Uh, so the next one is, is Mike Morrison. We have a written submission also. So I don't, I assume he still wants to speak. Okay, Mike. Mike, are you there? I don't know, but we do have his written submission. Okay, well, we can... Find me now. Yep, we can hear you. Okay. I can see. Hopefully you can't see my picture that I'm looking at here, which is not a salmon from Sherbrooke Lake. Well, we can't see you. <laughs> oh, good. <laughs> Well, thank you very much for the opportunity to participate in uh, this evening's activities. And I was, you know, from the start point of where we are now with the production of the current land use bylaws and the municipal planning strategy, which were produced two years ago, it's interesting to look back and see that in that documentation, there are seven different zones possible in the settlement areas. And there's only one zone possible, the general basic one in rural areas. Well, Wilder Park residents sort of feel that in a rural compact lakefront community like ours, we don't really belong in this general basic category where the only stated prohibited use in that zone is heavy industrial developments. So we feel that uh, the details that were provided in the general basic zone do not reflect the character of our lakeside community. Neither do they reflect our desire for more restrictive land use regulations. 
nor our concern for the future conditions of the water in our lake. Now, our organization, sure, Wildor Park, raised this issue initially with Chester Council in September 2020. We really appreciate the council and staff effort that's been put into this issue since that time. What we feel now is that the lakeside zone being proposed will meet our cottage community expectations. And it will also provide better protection to the future quality of the water in our lake, a desired municipal planning strategic objective. The Wildor Park community fully supports adopting the proposed rural area lakeside zone as soon as possible. Thank you very much. Okay. Donna McCulloch. I'm assuming well, that's my list anyway. Okay, Donna. Hello, can you hear? A little bit of a buzz going on there, but is it is the buzz gone? That is, yeah. Perfect. So um, I'll try and be quick, but um, I, you know, fully agree with everything that's been said by our other lakeside um, um, activists, uh, Nadine and Fred and Robin. I too own uh, property on the lake, and I think maybe I'm, I just want to present a brief analogy that uh, maybe you can follow follow through with me. I'm a physician, I've been a physician for 37 years. Um, I've been practicing, I'm still practicing. Uh, I, I used to do adult medicine. I've been in, in pediatrics now for more than 30 years and I do emergency medicine. And I think, you know, you've heard on and on about how this lake must be protected. And I think it can't be stated more strongly than that by using the analogy of humans and illness versus the wellness of the lake and the wellness of the of the Sherbrooke forest area. Um, most of the medicine, as a general rule over time, you'll see that nature almost always does it best when it comes to medicine. And when nature falters, it's usually because of the interference that man has done that has not been a good thing. So we don't protect our bodies the way we should. We don't exercise the way we should. We don't eat the way we should. We don't, uh, we put toxins in our bodies like alcohol and other things. And these are the things that man does. And then uh, nature can no longer do it best. And this is where nature begins to fail. And this is where nature needs medicine to help. And that's where, you know, medicine intervenes. But it's always best if medicine doesn't have to intervene and you do things prophylactically and you prevent these things from happening because otherwise you're chasing the, you know, the tail that wags. So um, likewise with the lake, we need to be proactive. We can't wait until this lake is destroyed until it's too late. You look at other lakes in the area like in Fall River and Grand Lake and Shuby Park, they've had algae blooms up to yin yang. The fact that we've had, you know, a couple of algae blooms now is the threat. It's, it's, it's roaring at us. It's saying, look, smarten up, start exercising, start eating a proper diet, start doing things properly, because there's only so much we can do once it's a runaway cart. So, I, so like the others, I want to applaud the council for looking at this in a proactive manner, which is far more effective than chasing something that's the runaway horse that's, you know, the cart that's gone already. It's too late then. So thank you. Thank you very much for your comments. Okay. Warren is next. Hi, can you hear me? Oh, yeah. All right. Um, thank you, uh, Dr. McCullough and the other speakers. Uh, we're a new family to Sherbrooke Forest. Our family has been attracted to this community for the better part of 20 years. And it's only been in the last year that we had the opportunity to become uh, property owners and members of the community. And we've been attracted to it for its virtues for as long as I can remember since we had very little children. Um, and the lake is a pristine known quantity that at this point um, we feel is 
is absolutely wonderful and we're very grateful to, to be able to use the lake as it is. I'm confident that the, the zoning uh, proposal that's made is the best way to provide assurances for our kids and future grandkids for the environmental and pollution controls that are required to assure a healthy uh, lake for all of us for now and in the future. So again, um, thank you for everybody and all the hard work uh, with the council and the community members that have uh, put forward um, to move in what I believe is in the right direction um, for this uh, outstanding uh, community. Thank you, everybody. Thank you for your comments. Olivia. Olivia was with Warren, so we're on to Hugh. Oh, sorry. Okay. Yeah. Okay. You have her. Uh, all right. Can you hear me now? Yeah. I mean, my computer skills at 78 are, um, are dwindling. Sorry. Um, I believe you got a letter from me already. Yeah. Your yes. call was the one with the loon on top. Yeah. Okay, so uh, I'm not going to cover that letter, and uh, I believe Robin and uh, and others have uh, really made a nice presentation. So I'm going to shrink mine down a little bit. But first, I want to thank you for allowing me to participate, and even more importantly, I want to thank you very much, and also uh, the develop the development team. Um, uh, for uh, all the hard work put into uh, creating this lakeside zone. So, so just a couple of points that I wanted to make. Um, uh, this, uh, you've heard a lot about, uh, about the uh, blue-green algae. Um, so I, I was recently made aware of, of a report uh, done by the Department of Environment on uh, algae blooms throughout uh, Nova Scotia. And it's actually uh, pretty scary. Um, so I'm going to cover the numbers with you real quickly. Um, in 2009, one was reported in, the, in our province. In 2011, two. In 12, 14 were reported. In 13, three. In 14, four. In 15, one. In 16, five. In 18, eight in 1916 and in 2017. So you can clearly see there's a huge trend uh, upwards of algae blooms uh, being reported uh, throughout the lake. I, I presume the increase uh, uh, is being uh, helped by uh, global warming. Um, and as others have mentioned, our lake has uh, has had three occasions in 2019. In 2020, we had two reported algae blooms. And in 2021, I know there was a, uh, a notice or a, 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 not a warning, but a notice put out by the Department of Environment about the algae bloom and how it might be uh, hazardous for swimming and stuff, which has already been mentioned, I believe. So you can see the algae bloom problem is growing. And, it's, and as others have said, it's not too soon to take measures to help protect the lake and this new zone with its, with its uh, restrictions on, on what type of developments and with uh, vegetated buff buffers and other uh, methods uh, goes a long way in, in helping protect the lake. Um, now, I know it, uh, that uh, the Sherbrooke Forest uh, folks, uh, 28 to 30 uh, owners, and I know that the Wildor folks, uh, as Mike has already pointed out, uh, around 90 members, that's about 120 or so members, uh, residents along the lake, support this uh, new zone. And in talking with uh, some folks in the Gully Lake area and also on the north end of the lake near the church camp, others also support it. So I think it's pretty awesome that 120 to 130 people, residents along our lake, are concerned enough about the lake and, and, its, and the quality of the water 
that um, they su they support this wonderful uh, new zone that that uh, is being proposed. Um, oh, I also want to mention that I know MODL is. Um, I don't. I don't want to say you, but there, you got one minute left. Just okay. MODL is also interested in this, and they attended. Uh, some of the MPAC meetings uh, via Zoom. Um, so with all that said, uh, again, I want to thank the council for bringing us forward and I hope that it passes. Thank you. Thank you very much. Okay, I'm on to number nine, Ron. Okay, Ron. Okay. Um, good evening. My name is Ron Renz, and um, I've owned a cottage with lake frontage since 2009 uh, at the mouth of the 40s River, and I enjoy really the peace and, and tranquility of the lake as well as the opportunities for swimming and kayaking. I mean, it's just part of my mental and emotional hygiene to spend as much time as possible at the lake. And I commend to the council for taking steps to safeguard the health of the lake for future generations to enjoy. So I favor the adoption of the proposed lakeside zone. As we rely on our municipal government to take the lead on environmental protection of natural resources. This initiative also could inspire all citizens to appreciate the role in reducing potential harms and preserving the resources that will contribute to the wealth and happiness of all. So I need not repeat the points that have already been made regarding the impact of runoff into the lake, but I did want to take the time to attend tonight and express my gratitude uh, and offer support in bringing this new zoning to fruition. So thank you for your time. And interest. Very much to your comments. Okay. Ken Garth. Oh, he should be in the list. Not my list. No, I'm I moved him up. He should, oh there he is. Okay. Okay, Garth. I think I'm unmuted now. Thank you. <laughs> All righty. Uh, I'm Garth Bangay. I'm a property owner on Sherbrooke Lake, but I'm coming to you tonight as the chair of the Sherbrooke Lake Stewardship Committee. And I wanted to begin by indicating the committee's very strong support for lakeside zoning on Sherbrooke Lake. Uh, our committee was established in 2017 by the councils of both MODL and Chester to design and implement a baseline water quality monitoring program for the lake and to engage and inform the public of the need to protect the lake from any degradation in water quality. In doing its work, the committee has also received technical support from the Coastal Action Foundation and a system of dedicated volunteers who conduct the actual lake sampling program. Now the purpose of establishing the baseline is to allow both the municipality of Chester and MODL to determine if the increasing use of the lake, including future public access, could negatively affect the lake's water quality. And in order to accomplish this task, we've measured over a three-year period, a number of variables, including acidity, nutrients, bacteria, heavy metals, algae, and, and, and others. Changes in some of these variables is almost always a product of human activities. Sometimes these actions are taken far away from our lake. For example, the burning of coal in Ohio can contribute to the increasing acidity of our lakes and streams and the deposition of heavy metals like mercury. Others, like the increasing growth of algae, are a direct result of additions of nutrients by human activities 
around the lake or in its watershed. These nutrients like phosphorus and nitrogen come from activities such as fertilizing our lawns and gardens, malfunctioning septic tanks, <clears throat> the removal of stabilizing natural vegetation along our shorelines. What our committee has identified through the first three years of our five-year baseline program is that there has been an increase in the presence of algae and under the right conditions, these algae can form blooms, potentially causing toxic conditions for humans and pets who come in contact with them. Now that increasing presence of blooms, and you've heard this from previous speakers, has caused the Ministry of Environment and Climate Change to issue public advisories, <clears throat> warning about potential harms. So just imagine these seasonal advisories are resulting in a lot of concern by lake property owners who correctly perceive a risk to the loss and enjoyment of the lake. Now too often individuals find it difficult to understand how their small individual actions can damage the lake ecosystem, which often leads to complacency and a sense that somehow this is someone else's problem. Your initiative is an important signal to all property owners that they are ultimately accountable for the condition of the lake. The establishment of a lakeside zone with attendant requirements to protect the environment through vegetative buffers go a long way towards reducing the negative impacts of human activities both today and tomorrow. It's never too late to enact these zoning requirements which will have the double effect of educating everyone about the need for good stewardship and serving to prevent the careless actions by the few. This is extremely important to understand. People are always happy to step up, but I think this initiative is sending a really important signal to people around the lake. Now, we also look to Chester's leadership, <laughs> which we hope MODL will emulate. And we're on the one minute time frame now. Yeah, thank you. I'm just, just wrapping up. And you can be sure the stewardship committee will be taking that message to MODL uh, once uh, this is passed and, and uh, goes forward. So thanks very much for the chance to talk to you this evening. And we'll be back with our proposed program of uh, lake monitoring uh, probably in the spring. So thanks again. Thank you. Look forward to seeing you. Okay, we're on number 11, which is Brian Fenner. Hi there. Um, thanks for letting me speak this evening. I wasn't actually aware of any of this until quite recently, so I reserved a space to speak in the event that I felt strongly about any of the information I received today. Uh, and I've got to thank the municipal office and Sharon for being very accommodating and providing it on such short notice. So please uh, excuse my ignorance if any is present as I hadn't had a lot of time to go through this. Um, and my apologies if my comments are outside of the scope of this meeting, but uh, I think that protecting the environment around our lakes is very important. Um, and I'm not against this in any way. I just like some clarity on a few of the items. Uh, one of them was addressed at the beginning, which um, was the actual zone. You know, if you have a property that's 100 feet across the lake, but it's three or four acres, does it make sense that you're not allowed to do the same types of activities at the back of your property that your neighbor on the other side of the property line is able to do? Uh, for example, keeping livestock or having a container on your property for storage, which are two items noted here. Uh, and another item is some clarity on the, the buffer zone. You know, for example, on my property, the only cleared land is at the lakefront. And if I were to clear the same amount of land on another part of my property, it would mean removing some very old, large trees, and it would most likely result in 
more silt running into the lake. So uh, again, if these are outside of the scope of this meeting, I do apologize, but I just wanted to mention those items. Hey, I don't know, uh, Garth, if you want to um, yeah, I, can, I think I can make a couple of, of comments to the to the first question on sort of the extent of the zone and the back of the property versus the, the piece closer to the lake. Um, you're you're right on there. The way that it's drafted is when or if we're considering uh, zoning this around the lake, um, that would be part of the discussion. And I think part of the considerations would be given our how large are the lot sizes, those kind of things. So. When we were drafting the zone, we had some initial discussions around, you know, should it be 100 meters deep? Should it be 500 meters deep? And ultimately what we felt was the best, and I think what council agreed with was, we'll look at it and look at it on a case by case basis. So there's, there is nothing in here to say it has to be a minimum of, I mean, I guess it has to be more than 10 meters because we've got a 10 meter vegetative buffer, but beyond that, there really is no limitation either. It so depends it, on the circumstances. Exactly, it'll depend on the circumstances and uh, things like lot size, topography, slope, and all those kind of things. I think would be things that we would want to look at when we're when we're considering that. Um, on the the second piece, um, a little trickier to comment on that. Uh, the purpose of the vegetation at the lake shore is to slow down and, and absorb as much of that runoff as possible. Basically, at the point when it goes into the lake. Um, the comments about other mature trees, we, rightly or wrongly, we don't have any sort of tree bylaw or regulations. Um, administratively, that would be really difficult to enforce and, and we have to know all the trees that were out there. So it's, it's kind of impractical, I think, on a wide scale basis. Um, we would certainly encourage you not to cut down the mature trees, uh, but but yeah, I think that's kind of the comment I can offer there. The, the, the purpose of the vegetation is ideally to basically surround the lake, um, kind of the way forestry buffers work. If you look on Google Maps at the province of Nova Scotia and other lakes and how forestry has been done, you can always see there's sort of a ring of vegetation left. Ours is going to be much, you know, not as wide as that, but the purpose is still the, the same thing. Yeah. So I hope, hopefully that provides some clarity, although it's, I think, like Garth said, this is, uh, they're all gonna be based on individual applications. Right, and uh, thank you for your comments. And that was something that I didn't know uh, prior to today. So um, I do feel a lot more comfortable with the information I received. That's all, thanks. Thank you. Thanks, so, Brian. Yeah. So I'm Dan to Ken Ruth. No, Ken won't be joining, but we do have an additional um, attendee. It's Debbie Reeves. Debbie? Debbie Reeves? Yeah. Is that it? Yeah. We didn't receive any emails, additional emails, or um, comments. So. Okay. So let Debbie in. Okay. She should be joining now. Yeah. Hey, Debbie. <laughs> <laughs> you can go ahead. Maybe she isn't joining us. Well, I don't see her over here, right? Let me say that. I see her. Debbie, are you there? I, I think maybe I am now. Okay. Yeah, yeah, we, can, we can hear you now. Uh, no, I didn't really ask to speak this evening. Uh, oh, okay. However, I would say that I appreciate the, you know, support from my fellow uh, owners uh, around the lake and my neighboring cottagers that we've always been uh, neighbors with and work with. Uh, my first venture to the lake was probably, oh, uh, I wouldn't want to say how old, how long it was because that would tell you how old I am. <laughs> well, no. <laughs> Excuse me. Nothing. Just keep going. <laughs> uh, but uh, we've owned land on the lake for a hundred plus years, I think, roughly. So, um, and always been cognizant of of looking after it. And I appreciate the uh, the 
uh, Rob uh, mentioning that, you know, they uh, appreciate it with respect, uh, you know, th their forestry neighbors. I, you know, I and my family have always tried to respect our cottage neighbors and, you know, do the best we can related to, you know, uh, road usage and, and what we do on our, our lands. We don't disrupt their ability to get to and from their properties. And uh, I think basically this is a, a fairly good zone. Uh, the zone itself is good. Uh, the parameters around setbacks, I think will be interesting, but, you know, realistically, I hope people realize that they don't affect forestry operations because those are provincial. And I've said that before. Uh, to the gentleman's point about cutting down his trees, uh, I could, uh, if he wanted to reach out to me, I might be able to assist him with someone I could help him get to accomplish that in a light touch manner. So that's what I do, uh, you know, around the, around the, the, with the, those who stop to talk to me. So, um, yeah, I'm, I'm supportive as the zone exists. I'm concerned about the, um, overlays and the setback distances that may be put into the, you know, details to be impactful in the future uh, is for the forestry owners compared to the cottage owners. But other than that, uh, the zone itself is a good thing. And, you know, um, I'm a proponent of trying to do the best we can to uh, protect uh, wallet, wa our water areas and our water quality. So it's healthy for all of us. So thank you very much, uh, uh, Mr. Warden, for allowing me to speak without being. Good to hear from you again, Dave. Okay, so I believe that's it. So. Um... Yes, it's um, that closes the public session. So I don't know if there are any comments or questions from from council. We've been here and talked about this numerous occasions. So. If there are none, then I, I guess what I'm looking for is uh, somebody prepared to make a motion that we adopt. I am. We have a second. Somebody in the room or on the screen? Second. Second is by Jeffrey. Discussion on the motion. All those in favor? Opposed? Motion is carried. So I'd like to thank everybody for their participation tonight. And uh, that is the only item on the agenda. So uh, a motion to adjourn would be in order. So moved. Second. Second. All those in favor? Opposed? Uh